can dine at Roberto Italian Restaurant uh, this coming Wednesday for lunch and dinner to help benefit Eastern Henrico Fish. Uh, if you tell them uh, that you're there for fish, they'll receive 10% of your total bill. Also, uh, there's more details in the bulletin, uh, but save the date for VBS. Coming soon will be the uh, link to be able to sign up to volunteer as well as registering your kids. Uh, but it's June 26th through the 30th, and you'll see that and be on the lookout for more details as well. If you all can't tell, we got uh, some great young folks up here to help lead uh, worship today. Uh, they are from the academy, and uh, very excited to see them lead worship. Uh, I'm going to bring up Bill Stamper to uh, pray over us first. Good morning, New Bridge. I'd like to take this opportunity. I haven't had much of an opportunity since we've been back, but since Terry and I have been back, I'd just like to thank you for welcoming us, welcoming us back the way you did. Uh, the day, the first day that we came back, I walked in the door right there and I told Terry, I said, we're home. So uh, I'd just like to thank you all for welcome, welcoming us. My mouth is not working very well. Welcoming us back uh, to New Bridge. Um, We've been through a lot the last few years. Uh, last January, I, I lost my mother, and this, this past January, I lost my brother. And um, when I was going through my brother's things, uh, he was down in Wilmington, North Carolina, I found that he had my grandmother's old family Bible from Big Stone Gap, Virginia. And uh, in that Bible, I found a prayer that was written by my grandfather, Clyde Stamper. Um, he was a coal miner from the time he was 16 years old. He worked in the coal mines. And at 65, he died of black lung. So I know he suffered a lot. And I remember seeing him struggle for a breath. So this prayer means a lot to me. This morning, I'd like to pray for the church. I'd like to pray for each one of these young people up here. I'd like to thank them for their witness. And uh, I know it's, it's a lot for them to do this, but I, I, I think that uh, they're doing a great job. But for my prayer this morning, I want to read this little prayer that, my, what, that was my grandfather's stampers. This will be my prayer. Please pray with me. Teach me, my Lord, to be sweet and gentle in all events of life. Let me put myself aside to think of the happiness of others, to hide my little pains and heartache so that I may be the only one to suffer from them. As I go my rounds from one experience to another, let me whisper from time to time a word of love to thee. May my life be loved in the supernatural, full of power, for good and strong in its purpose of sanctity. Amen.
We're going to go ahead and continue our worship by singing a song that you are familiar with, 10,000 Reasons. Um, and then after that, we're going to introduce you to a new song, You Say, um, which is a very popular radio song by Lauren Daigle. And um, if you ever listen to Christian radio, you'll pick up on it pretty quickly.
pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the gifts and talents of these youth, and I thank you for leading us in the truth of your word and just how much you love us. And I just pray that you would prepare our hearts for the message that Pastor J.D. has for us. In your name, amen. Can I just say, oh my goodness, how how am I supposed to how am I supposed to get myself together after that? Um, at Newbridge Academy, we have a lot to be thankful for, and it's those hearts, the hearts of young people, that keep us coming back every day to do what we do to our praise team first let me tell you they're not used to having people stand up and sing back with them when they sing in chapel everybody stands up but it's almost like singing to a wall out there because there's just usually no response so I'm quite sure that you singing with them not only was an encouragement but um, that it brought them strength and I appreciate that for you for you guys that sang that last song I'll say this there's not one person in this room there's not one person who is watching this as a live stream who has not felt and experienced the same kind of despair that teenagers do and that that song talks about We've all been there. As a matter of fact, even at where we are in life today, we're not immune from having those times when we struggle because of the things that are going on in the world around us and that affect us. So thank you for, thank you for your testimony through song this morning. Um, it was powerful. Um, I don't know that this message is going to have the power that the worship has this morning and I'm okay with that because God has used you to touch hearts and to touch lives um have you well I know you have if you're a parent you've experienced times if you're a a, a boss or a supervisor you've experienced times when someone has come to you and told you what sounds like a big elaborate story that is almost unbelievable um, only to calm you down by saying well that's not true what really happened was only this so it's not really that bad right our kids don't our don't our kids have a way of preparing us for the news that they need to give us, whatever that might be. Uh, most of the time, it's build it up, make it look worse than it is, so that they can back it back down to where it really is, and that not seem so bad. Pretty smart. And what they don't realize is that it's not a new thing. It's the same thing we did with our parents when we were younger. Um, and we knew that we were in trouble. So um, as, we, as we get started this morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 2, um, Paul spent a lot of his time dealing with the Jewish people, um, not just Jewish leaders, but Jewish people in general. And um, he was explaining to them that both the Jew and the Gentile is in need of the gospel. Everyone needs salvation or rescue from judgment. Although some Jews would claim that they have an advantage in salvation because they were God's chosen people. It's true. They were God's chosen people, but Paul spent quite a bit of his time explaining to them um, over and over. You sometimes think your child or your children are slow learners. It was no different in what Paul was dealing with here with the Jewish people. Um, they would think that they had an advantage and Paul would explain over and over to them that their, their advantage is not 
um, that they're God's chosen people and that that gives them a leg up on this process of salvation. So in chapter 3, Paul is, at the beginning, he's continuing to um, deal with a little bit of that that's still been left over from where he was in chapter 2. But he wants to answer the question, how do people become righteous? How do people become right with God? But first he, he has to back up and he, he has to work a little more to, to get the Jewish people on the same page that, that he is on for this particular time. Paul had preached men, in many cities and he knew how the people typically responded to his messages. Jewish people often responded by saying, well, we're God's chosen people and we must have an advantage in judgment. Um, but are you saying that our own condemnation is that the law is, is our condemnation? God gave us the law. It was for us that, that it was given so that we could be, um, so that we could know what was right, so that we could be right with him. In verse 1 of chapter 3, Paul says, What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Paul says that basically you're asking, what's the point? If we don't have an advantage because we're God's chosen people, what exactly is the point of being a Jew and being under the law that God has given? In verse 2, Paul answers that question. And he says to the people, he says, much in every way. First of all, they have been, um, they've been entrusted with the word of God. The scripture was given to God's people, not just so that they had it for themselves, but so that they could keep it, that they could protect it, that they could make sure that it lived on through the generations, but God had no intention of it being restricted to just, just the Jewish people. He wanted it to be there for everyone. In, in verse 2, as he says, the, the Jews have the scripture that it's an advantage, but there's a downside to it too. Going back to chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, those who sin under the law will be judged by the law. The law reveals requirements that people do not meet. There was not one person in Paul's audience, nor has there been one person who has ever lived, aside from Jesus, who could look at the law and honestly say, I am guilty of no wrong. Now, the Jewish people didn't really need Paul to tell them that. They knew it, but they certainly didn't want other people to think that that's how God looked at them. So what is the advantage? Paul will say more about that when we get to Romans chapter 9. But here in chapter 3, his goal is not to explain how special the Jews are, but to explain that they are just like everybody else, that they, they need to be saved through Christ Jesus. He's not going to elaborate on their privileges. He's not going to make their heads bigger than what they already are until he explains to them what their need is for salvation, just like our need, just like the needs of everyone else. And so, in verse 3, Paul asks the question, what if some, talking about the Jews, were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify, nullify God's faithfulness? Will the fact that some Jews sin cause God to, to back out of His promise? Oh my goodness, I hope not. If, if our sin, if our sin could change the God of all creation, there would never be a hope for the Jews or the Gentiles. There'd be no hope for anyone if our sin is what brought about the change in, in God's way of looking at us. Paul says in verse 4, certainly not. Let God be true and every human be a liar. God is always true to His word. And even though we are unfaithful, God is not. Never has God been unfaithful to anything that 
he has said to anything that he has done, God has never changed who he is, and he will never change who he is. He created humans, us, for a reason. And, and even if, or more accurately, not if, but when, we fall short of what God wants for us, his plan will still succeed. God's plan, the, the success of God's plan, does not rely on what I do. It doesn't rely on what you do. It doesn't rely on what man does. The success of God's plan is in the fact that it is God's plan. Now, I learned a long time ago that because I fail, it doesn't mean that God changes His plan. A long, long time ago, I knew clearly what God wanted me to do with my life. I acknowledged to God that I knew what He was saying to me. And then I got scared. I, I know what you feel like when you stand up in front of a group of people who are all watching everything that you're doing. It's a scary thing, isn't it? It doesn't change. It doesn't change. Anybody that says that they don't ever get nervous in front of a group of people, believe me, there is some group of people that all of us can stand in front of our peers and still be nervous. It just happens. Well, I knew what God had called me to do. And I ran from what God called me to do. I ran so far that I ran to the point that I was very confident that there was no way that what God called me to do could be salvaged. I've blown it. I've messed it up too bad. I've walked too far away. And, and I honestly believed that. I did with all of my heart. And because I believed that, I pursued other avenues. I pursued uh, a job that took advantage of the natural talents that God had given me to work with my hands. And I became very good at it. It provided for my family. Um, it, it gave me a sense of value. It gave me a sense of worth because I accomplished good things for, for people. But it wasn't what God's plan was for me. And like I said, I thought that, literally, I thought that ship had sailed. I worked in the boat business, in case you didn't know. So, when God started to do little things that allowed me the opportunity as a layperson to minister into the lives of people, I could see, okay, well, I blew it, but God is going to at least let me have a little bit of it, just a, a small piece of what could have been. And for me, I was more than happy to settle for having just a little bit, just being able to make a difference in the lives of of some. Little did I know that God would take what I saw as a very small crack in the flaws of my life and that He would open the doors wide for me to do what He had planned for me to do. The, the Jewish people here, the, the Jewish people are thinking, well, if we're God's chosen people, if 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 he's given the scripture to us and he's making, he's making known to the world through the scripture that we have what, who he is and, and what his plan is, then certainly God is going to look out for us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to make sure that no matter what, we're going to be seen as superior to all other people. Because we're God's people. Paul then quotes a scripture about God being true. Psalms 51 verse 4 says, As it is written, 
that you may be justified or proven right in your words and may overcome when you are judged. This was David talking in, in Psalms. And he was, David was basically saying, if God chooses to punish me, then it's because God is right. So for those people, that audience that Paul was talking to, he wanted them to understand that what they think, what they feel, isn't going to determine what God's process is. God gets to choose the process. God gets to choose how we are judged, guilty or not. And when God judges us guilty, it's because, <laughs> newsflash, we're guilty. It's not rocket science. When God judges us guilty, it's not news to us. It's not news to us. If you're, if you're older than, you know, than, than a small child, you've got a pretty good understanding of the difference between what's right and what's wrong and what God says that we should do and what God says that we shouldn't do. And when we mess up, I don't know about you, but when I mess up, I have several people in my life that don't mind telling me that I've messed up. Maybe you do too. Maybe, maybe you're one of those people that don't mind telling me that I've messed up. But the truth is, most of the time, I already know. I already know. I, I'm not questioning whether or not I messed up. We are guilty because God says we're guilty. We know that, that we are responsible his covenant with Israel said that they would, they would endure, that they would go through unpleasant circumstances for their failures. And indeed, many times through the history of Israel, they did just that. And sometimes, sometimes the consequence, consequences were, were fairly small, all things considered. Sometimes they were huge. Sometimes it involved captivity for long, long, long periods of time when things weren't good for the Israelites. When God delivered them from the Egyptians, great day, good thing. Didn't take them long to decide that it was a mistake because look, now we're between a rock and a hard place. The rock is the Red Sea behind us the hard place is the Egyptian army coming at us from the other side. We should have just stayed in Egypt. Well, that wasn't God's plan. God allowed them to pass through the Red Sea. We know the story. God didn't, God didn't make them need to spend 40 years traveling from captivity to the promised land. All those circles that they did, well, if God could show us a map of how many times the Israelites walked in their same footsteps over and over again while they were in the wilderness, it, it, it would be mind-boggling because it didn't need to take 40 years except that God was bringing judgment when they sinned against Him. In God's righteousness, He judges us guilty and He determines what the consequences are going to be. Paul deals with another objection that the Jewish people have there in verse 5. But if our, if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, if it, if it helps us to see the righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing His wrath on us? Paul says that he's using a human thought there. Here's the argument. You can hear your kids using this logic against you. And if you think about it, you can probably as an adult think of times that you've used the same logic on other people in, in your life. Here's the logic. If we sin, we give God an opportunity to show that he is right. In essence, <laughs> they're saying when, when we sin, we're doing God a favor. So he shouldn't punish us. Pretty silly argument, isn't it? 
when we sin, they're saying when we sin, we're giving God the opportunity to show all of the people in the world His power and who He is and how good He is. And because of that, because we're helping Him out, He really shouldn't judge us for that. Is God unjust? Verse 6, Paul says, certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? God said that He would judge the world, and He's right in doing so. We have no position to say to the Creator of all things that we should be outside of His judgment. And basically, that's what the Jewish people were trying to say to Paul here. Paul paraphrases the argument a little bit in verse 7. Someone might argue, if the truth of God has increased through my lie to His glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? If my sin shows how God is good, why should He punish me? Same question. Just asked in a different way. If what I do wrong is helping other people to see how amazing God is when He forgives me, why should there be punishment? You know, when our kids mess up, um, and it, it comes to our attention, and we have to deal with it, we can't just let it go, because there's a lesson that needs to be taught in order that our kids don't just continue to make the same mistake. The lesson can be taught. And they can get the point. And they can promise never to do it again. So does that mean that there shouldn't be any consequence for what they had done? Do we just say, okay, they've learned their lesson? They won't do it anymore. It's possible they won't. But sometimes, even though the lesson is learned, there still needs to be consequences to reinforce that we can't do the wrong thing and expect that nothing's going to happen. We teach that lesson to our children when we give them consequences for the things that they do that they shouldn't have. And it's no different with God's people here. Sometimes there has to be consequences in order for us to see just how much God loves us. If we didn't love our children, if we didn't love our children, we wouldn't care what they do. It would make no difference. But because we do, We invest more into their lives. In verse 8, Paul gives another version of, of this argument. He says, why not say, let's do evil that good may come. Hey, let me do something bad so God can do something good. It's the same argument over and over and over again. Do you get the idea that the Jewish people were slow learners? Just like we are many times. They kept coming back with the same argument over and over and over again. The gospel does not give any permission to anyone, Jew, Gentile, nobody. The gospel does not give permission to us to sin, ever. In verse 9, Paul finally returns to what he really wanted to be dealing with. What then? What shall we conclude of them? Do we have any advantage? Are we, meaning the Jews, better off than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jew and Gentile, the Greeks, that they are all under sin. Nobody, nobody, Paul says, is is not guilty in in doing wrong in God's eyes. Jews have no advantage because we're all sinners. 
we're all influenced by this, this thing, this nature, this human nature, this it's all about me nature that leads to sin. But God doesn't play favorites. He doesn't give salvation advantages to anyone. And certainly not to those who He has given much to and He expects much from, like the Jewish people. Then in the next eight or nine verses, in kind of a rapid-fire argument, Paul quotes verses in uh, uh, quotes verses, a series of scriptures to support his point that everyone is a sinner. These verses mention various parts of the body, the mind, the mouth, the throat, the tongue, the lips, the eyes. The picture is that people are thoroughly evil. doesn't matter if we have a little bit of good, maybe it'll be enough. That's not what the Scriptures has taught up to that point. Verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, There is none who understand. There is none who seek God. Verse 12, They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable or worthless. There is none who does good, no, not one. Verse 13, their throats are open, are an open tomb. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps, snakes, vipers, is under their lips. Verse 14, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Verses 16 and 17, destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace is... They have not known. Verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Some Jews might say that those scriptures are true about Gentiles, but not about them. Paul answers them in verse 19. And he says, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. The scripture, the law in the bigger sense applies to people who are under the law, the Jews. They're sinners. Gentiles are too. But Paul isn't trying to explain to the Gentiles here that, that they're sinners because the Gentiles don't have an argument with the fact that they're guilty. They don't have an argument with the fact that they've done things that are wrong and that, that the one true real God has the right to stand in judgment over them. It's the Jewish people who think that they should get a pass. Now you might think, we just covered nine verses in a minute. We're on a roll. We're going to be out of here well before the Methodist and make it to lunch. Not so quick. Why do the Scriptures apply to the Jews? It is a fair question. Paul has no argument with them asking why it applies to them just like everybody else so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may be guilty or held accountable before God. Why do the Scriptures matter? Because they apply to all of us equally, fairly, and justly. Humanity will stand before the judgment seat of God and the result is described in verse 20 of chapter 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. By the standards of the law, the Jewish people didn't have a leg to stand on. They had to realize, they had to acknowledge that we all, fall short of what God's law is. Why does the, what, what does the law do instead of just claim us to be guilty? Paul says, rather through the law, 
we become conscious of our sin. The, the, the thing that we gain from having the law is an understanding of what God's expectation is of each one of us. When, when you have children, you start teaching them from the very earliest moments of their life what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do? Now, there are lots of different parenting styles and, and I'm not here to debate parenting styles with anybody. I can tell you that when my kids were growing up, when they were very little, if they were touching something that they weren't supposed to touch, somebody would give them a little smack on the hand and say, uh-uh. Now, in my house... In the early days, that was me. Because mama, mama was too soft-hearted. If it had just been left to mama, we would have raised two really good criminals. <laughs> because they'd have never been told no. They'd have never been corrected. But even she learned that correction is necessary. And that applies to all of us. We all need, we all need to be taught. We all need the correction that comes in our life. And we need the correction that God brings into our life far above the correction of our parents or our bosses or our peers. We, we should be desperate for the correction that God desires to bring in our life. Now, His Word tells us that because we're all sinners, we're all guilty. And, and that ought to be enough to make the Jews and the Gentiles very worried. It ought to be enough to make anybody give up. We, we failed. We're wrong. We're guilty. Why even try anymore? Again, it's a legitimate question to ask. Why even try anymore? Because there's good news coming. It didn't stop there. God didn't stop there. So we, we hold on just a little bit because there is good news coming. Verse 21, Paul introduces the good news with an important set of words. At the beginning of verse 21, Paul says, but now. But now. Hold on. Wait a minute. Paul is about to make a contrast for the people. We can't be declared righteous by the law. But there is good news. There is a way that we can be declared righteous. Verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Being witnessed or testified to by the law and by the prophets. Paul says, hang on people. As bad as you are. As bad as we are. There's hope. There's hope. So, you know, don't jump off the ship without knowing how to swim just because you think it's too late. Here Paul gets back to what he announced in, in chapter 1, verse 17, that the gospel reveals to us, Jew and Gentile, it reveals to us God's righteousness. Since we're sinners, we cannot be, be declared righteous by observing the law. We're going to fail. It must be through some other means. God will declare us righteous in a way other than through the law. And although the law does not make us righteous, it does give evidence about another means to righteousness. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. Verse 22. Greek, Gentile, male, female, Man, woman, child. There is no difference. 
when it comes to being made right with God, there is no difference. He points out that righteousness is a gift. We don't deserve it. But God gives us a status of being counted as righteous. He gives this to all who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was faithful, we, we can be given the status of being righteous. If it were not for what Jesus did for us, there would be no other way for us to be counted righteous before God. The pathway to righteousness gives no advantage to any people group. All are counted righteous in the same way. There's no difference. Paul says, verse 23, and this is the verse that we all know from Romans chapter 3. When we think about what this chapter has, there's one verse that, that stands out to Christians. Paul says, for all have sinned, both Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's us. We're the all. The Jews are the all. The Muslims are the all. The, the Mormons are the all. We're all guilty. And we're all judged by the same God and in the same way. When our works are judged by the law, we fall short. We can't work our way into heaven. We can't earn our way into heaven. We can't buy our way into heaven. The Bible tells us that in all of those efforts, we will fall short. But our weakness will not stop God's plan. Being justified, being declared righteous, freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 24. How are we made righteous? Through the redemption of that is in Christ Jesus. There is no other way. Because of what Jesus did, we can be made right. And it's done as a gift by God's grace. We're not made sinless and perfect, but in the courtroom of God, we are declared righteous instead of guilty. We are counted as acceptable to God and as faithful to His covenant. Whether we feel forgiven or not, we are forgiven because Jesus Christ paid our debt in full. Through His death, His burial, and His resurrection, we know that Jesus paid it all. There is nothing left for us to pay. Christ, God's Son, has paid it all. When, when I think about this, there's a commercial that used to come on some years ago, and I think I've seen it around particular times of the year, and I don't even know what the commercial is actually advertising, but what I do know is that um, in this commercial, there's, um, it, it's a grocery store, and it's the deli counter at the grocery store. There's a couple of ladies standing there at the, the counter, and there's a, a big guy, a huge guy, an ex-football player, who's standing there in the same area, and the guy behind the deli counter, he says, number 43. And without hesitation, my wife's shaking her head, he's not going to do this, he's not going to do this. Oh, yes he is. The guy behind the deli counter says, number 43. And this big guy behind these two little ladies says, whoa, 43, that's me, that's me, ladies, I got number 43, going to get me some cold cuts, going to give me some cold cuts, going to have me some cold cuts today. He was excited over baloney. But as Christians, as Christians, we're afraid to show any excitement about the truth of the gospel that says that we are forgiven that we are made righteous with God, not because of what we do, but because our number has been called. Jesus paid it all. That is the only way that we are made righteous. In God's eyes, there is no other way. What permits God to change the verdict 
from guilty? Paul uses a a variety of word pictures to explain this. Jesus has paid the price to rescue us from slavery. He has bought us back in essence. That is what redemption means. We are redeemed because Jesus has bought us back. Verse 25 tells us that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. God Himself provided the payment that He would require. God Himself provided the sacrifice that would change our sentence from guilty to forgiven and made righteous. Because of His love and His mercy, God provided Jesus as the means by which we can be set at one with Him. I am allowed to walk with God because of what Jesus did. You are allowed to walk with God because of what Jesus did. The Jews are allowed to walk in God's presence because of what Jesus did. Verse 25, Paul says to demonstrate his righteousness, to show that he is faithful to his promise because in his forbearance, he had left the sin committed beforehand unpunished. God hadn't forgotten anything, but God chose not not to issue the verdict of guilty before He had provided the way for our atonement. Normally, a judge who let criminals go free would be called unjust. Is that what God is doing? Not at all. This verse says that God is not unjust when He justifies the wicked because He has provided Jesus as the means of atonement. Paul also wants them to know one more time, we are all equal. Where then, Paul says, is boasting? Can the Jews boast about an advantage over the Gentiles? This is what they've been doing. But it, it has no merit. It has no value. When it comes to salvation, there is nothing to boast about. We can't even boast about faith. Faith does not make us better than other people. We are only receiving what God gives. Faith is a choice. God doesn't force His forgiveness on anyone. It is offered. It is made available. But He doesn't force it on anyone. It is a choice to trust, to believe, to have faith. Paul is making two points that reinforce what he's trying to to get them to understand that no one can boast and that righteousness is by grace rather than by the law or works. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We have to understand that it takes faith because we don't have the physical evidence to prove that we are not guilty so that we can be counted righteousness. All we have is the promise of God that we're forgiven. I am, I am so thankful that when God looks at me as flawed and as failed as I might be, I am so thankful that God doesn't look at me and dwell on the sin that has, has been in my life. He looks at me and what He dwells on is the righteousness that has been placed on me because of what Christ did for me.
Paul wants those people. God wants us to understand that the most important takeaway from the third chapter of Romans is that the Jewish people don't have any special advantage when it comes to an eternal home or forgiveness, that the atonement for their sin is the same as the atonement for everyone else, Jew, Christian, anyone else, the lost. The atonement is received by faith. We believe that Jesus' death did something that allows us to be forgiven. You choose what you believe. You choose what you trust. The cause of salvation. The cause of salvation is what Jesus did when He gave His life. The means by which it is offered is through grace. Our works while they may be important for spreading the good news of the gospel, our works don't count toward our home in heaven. Salvation is offered to us by grace and it is received through faith. How are we made righteous? Why do we have hope? What makes the difference? What makes the difference is the choice that I make, the choice that you make to trust in what God has done, to accept what He has provided through His Son, to be forgiven, not made perfect here, but to be forgiven and to be given that eternal home that will be with Him forever. What does God offer? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. But there is no exclusivity on it. God's offer of forgiveness is for all. The Jewish people They wanted to keep their piece of of the pie. And they wanted it to be sweeter than anybody else's. Sometimes as Christians, we don't act much different. I know I have a home in heaven. I know I'm saved. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. My sins are forgiven. I don't have anything to worry about. That's not That's not how God wants us to approach the gift that He has given to us. It's a gift that we can never wear out, that we can't lose, and that we can share over and over and over and over again. It doesn't make my home in heaven any less amazing if the number of people who are going to heaven increases. As a matter of fact, as a sinner saved by grace, our greatest desire should be to want to share the love of God so that all of those around us come to have that same eternal home that we're assured of. Their righteousness, their forgiveness, comes exactly the same way that ours did. Pray with me. Father, I am so grateful that you, when you created each one of us, you created us with a plan, with a purpose. And Lord, I thank you that even though we may fail because we're human. Lord, I I thank you that it doesn't change your righteousness. It doesn't change your plan. 
And Lord, I thank you that you are a faithful God. Faithful to your people. Faithful to your word. Faithful to your promise. Which is why when I'm hurting or confused or don't seem to be able to find the right answers, I can still trust that you have all that I need. Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to desire to have that relationship with you that pours out onto others that they might see how amazing and loving and full of grace our God is and that they might desire that relationship with you that we have today. Father, I just pray. I pray that, that as you are true to your word, that you would help us to be faithful to you in all that you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as our praise team comes back? There is a question or two that perhaps you need to answer. Question number one is, do you have that faith? Have you experienced that forgiveness that God has made available through His Son? Do you have the assurance of that home in heaven? We are saved by grace through faith. We can't work our way into heaven. Maybe you're here this morning and you can't say that there's been a time in your life that you've accepted Christ as your Savior. That you've asked Him to forgive you and, and made Him the Lord of your life. If you haven't, I encourage you to make today that day to know that you have that relationship. If you have that relationship, my question is, what are you doing with it? Like the Jews, are you trying to keep it to yourself? Are you trying to keep it for yourself? Or are you, are you willingly sharing it with those who God puts in your path? Because that is what God has called us to do. This, this song isn't so much a song of invitation as it is a song of pouring out our heart to God. But if God's speaking to you, don't shut him out. Don't shut him out. Allow him to work in your life to bring about in you his glory.
is good. It's been good to be in God's house. It's been good to see these young people share the talent that God has given and minister into our hearts today. Pray with me. Father, we are so thankful that your love for us led your son to the cross. Lord, we are thankful that it is through that cross that we are redeemed, that we are forgiven, and that we are given the opportunity to be made righteous in you. Father, we pray that as we depart from this place, that we would depart with a desire to share the truth of that love and your grace with all those who will listen. Lord, let us be your witness. Let us be your servant. Father, we pray that in all that we do, it would put a smile on the face of God. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.